Sports at Chelsea. We may be on the cusp of a boardroom brawl between Todd Bowley and Verdad Egbali as well. Um, Henry, this is, uh, seems to be to do with, strangely enough, stadium expansion as well, or whether to build a new stadium. Um, Todd Bowley seems to be on the side of moving to Wells Court and building a, a stadium there, whereas Egbali wants to expand Stamford Bridge. Who do you think will come out on top of this? Whenever you write about Chelsea moving to Earl's Court, you get Earl's Court businesses and saying, it's impossible, we're already embedded in here, so prepare for a fight. I think expanding Stamford Bridge is just it's almost impossible because of the you obviously got the cemetery you've got the um you've got two major roads you've got the railway line i don't quite see how they do that you've also got you know quite wealthy local people who have access to lawyers who don't want skips outside their house for for, for three years so i really think that is it's incredibly difficult i mean when Todd Bowley did one of his rare sort of public appearances down at cobham that was that was the only question i asked him i said you realize transforming your squad um, is is one thing but actually the stadium is going to be your biggest thing and there are issues like, like you cannot raise certain amount part of Stamford Bridge because it dates back three four hundred years that there's a point in Richmond Park which allows you to stand on a point in Richmond Park and look towards St Paul's Cathedral and nothing can come in a way the way but if you then raise whatever it is the west end the east end whether it's the shed or Matthew, Matthew Harding upper you can't historically, legally do that. So they're all sorts of uh, issues. I wouldn't know where they're going to end up. I mean, they talked about Battersea at one point, but obviously that's gone, which ruined all our Battersea drugs home uh, headlines, <laughs> which we all came up with in the Didier Drogba <laughs> era. So, look, joking apart, it's a huge, huge issue for them and their fans. Mm. Is this all a bit strange then, Kieran, given that, as we've said there, it seems very impossible to either move stadiums or even to expand some of it. Is it a bit strange that this is the thing that is causing such a, a brawl within this boardroom? I think it's one of the things. I don't think it's the only one. Um, in terms of Clear Lake's vision, ultimately they are a finance house, they're looking for a return on an investment. I think Todd Bowley has perhaps become more invested on, on the, as Henry says, the soccer side of things. Um, and there is, there is conflict in, in terms of When's, it, when's our exit date? Because ultimately the nature of private equity is that you buy a business which you think is either undervalued or underperforming, you try to turn it round and then you make your money on, on in terms of the exit price. So it's, it's a bit like flipping a house. Um, Todd Bowley appears to have a longer game plan than, than Clear Lake and that's going to form the basis of where the club goes forwards. But they, it's, it's a bit like... JR and Bobby Ewing, uh, going back to <laughs> other feuding Americans. Um, but I, I, I don't think um, that they're, 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 they're going to be falling out. I don't think they'll be doing a, a funeral pyre of each other's uh, emails and so on just yet. Mm. If Bowley's the face of, of Chelsea then and Egbali's in the back room, who for you at the moment has more power at the club? Oh, very, very much Egbali. I, I think, I think uh, Todd Bowley has effectively become the maitre d'. He, he's, uh, in terms of... He is the person that the cameras pick on, but Egg Barley, from what I understand, is certainly the person that's involved as far as budgetary settings. With, with that in mind, do you see that eventually it will be Bowley that is moved on and moved out of the club, essentially, then? Not necessarily. I think it's a case of whoever buys out the other party clearly has to put together a lot of money. The, the, the buying price was £2.5 billion. Given the amount of money that the club has spent and invested in the playing squad, you'd be looking to recruit as substantially more than that. Whether that's actually worth it is a, is a separate question. You know, the, the club lost £249 million in 2023 before we had the benefit of property sales and player sales, which managed to bring those losses down to a slightly more acceptable level. Um, it's, it becomes very much then sort of a, a trophy asset as opposed to a financial asset, and, and then you've got the different owners taking different perspectives. Henry, with the way that Chelsea have been doing business over the last few seasons since those owners have come in, I think a lot of people were very shocked in the way they were doing it. Um, obviously, there were, there were times on the pitch where it definitely wasn't working. It's been a fairly good start to this season. Do you think in any sense going forward that, that maybe we'll be 
eating a bit of humble pie in terms of the way that Chelsea have operated because it has been so different. Yeah, I was at Anfield at the weekend and even though Chelsea lost, you could just see what Maresca is trying to do. He's making good players better. You see that with, with Jackson. I think they've still bought too many wide players, but you know, you look at Cole Palmer, obviously 40 million, he's probably an 80 million pound player now, England's player of the year. So they've still got to sort out the goalkeeper and elements of the defence, but when they've got some of the injuries back, I, th I think they look in a, like looking at a, a decent shape. But as Kieran says, the costs there, I mean, how much is a new stadium going to cost them? Probably do, two billion. And you've got all the issues with the pitch, the, you know, the Chelsea pitch owners. You know, they can't, if they move away, I think there's some issue. They can't even call themselves Chelsea. Right. They can't even use the crest. And that is where our new friend, the regulator, can come in and say, well, actually, we, we're protecting these things as well as the CPO and the Chelsea fans. So, look, there's so many issues. Actually, what's going on on the pitch is probably one of the better things at Chelsea at the moment. Yeah. Uh, Kieran, do you think that Chelsea have turned the corner just because it's happened on the pitch or do you feel that the amount they've spent the the more chaos is simply around the corner for for that club um my concern for Chelsea is that they they a they've spent unprecedented amounts of money um they now have a squad which which is unbalanced and if you've got a player who's on a very good contract and it's got seven or eight years left Who's going to be willing to take that up? Now, certainly the noises that Chelsea have put out is that these players have come in on very low basic salaries. If I was an agent, I wouldn't have advised my client to do that. So I'm, I'm a little bit confused as to the sort of the logic of, of what we're hearing from what, the club itself. What do you think the solution is for Chelsea? If, if you came in as the, the new CEO, how would you change the way they operate? Um, I, I, well, I'd move to a similar model to what we're seeing in Brighton because yeah, obviously I'm biased in, in terms of, of that perspective, um, in terms of trying to recruit or trying to, first of all, set a style of play and agree that with the director of football and then the coach and the playing squad are fit in with, with, with that style um, and, and everything flows from that. I mean, to be fair to Chelsea, they've been absolutely magnificent in terms of player sales. They've generated £745 million since Sir Alex Ferguson retired, which is four times as much as Manchester United. Now, you could say that Manchester United's a destination club and players haven't wanted to move on, but there's been too many players who have come who have effectively left at the end of their contracts for nothing or have left towards the end of their contracts for next to nothing um, to, to, to say, whereas Chelsea... You've well, we, yeah, we had Mason Mount, fantastic price for him. Billy Gilmore, Tamori, Tammy Abrahams. You, you look at that that ability of Chelsea to to spot young talent and move it on. I think that's something I would focus on repeating, and perhaps then saying, do we want more of those players to come through? Because from a from a Chelsea fan's point of view, who do they associate the club with? John Terry. Mm. Well, John Terry was was one of theirs. Mm. It's an interesting point, Henry, about whether Chelsea should copy the likes of Brighton, given the size of the club. But would you say that clubs like Chelsea and Manchester United really should look at Brighton as the prime example and, and copy that kind of system? Yeah, and well, Chelsea looks at them. They tried to buy most of the club, didn't they? I mean, they, they almost sort of <laughs> took the Amex to uh, South West London. Um, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, Brighton do things so well. But, but Kieran makes so many good points there. And the, the young players thing, it's so frustrating for your fan. As you say, John Terry was, was there throughout. You know, they lost Conor Gallagher who was their captain. You know, the fans had a, you know, a banner with him with his, uh, in, the, in the shed with the armband on. You need those players. Look at Liverpool at the moment, Trent Alexander-Arnold, Curtis Jones. You know, you do need those players. And I do feel slightly sorry for the Chelsea Academy at the time. They develop all these players and then they do get sold on. I would love to see PSR just tweak a little bit so that uh, salaries of homegrown players were excluded from PSR calculations. So we would encourage clubs to sort of promote more young players into the first team rather than just offload them at the first opportunity because it's pure profit. Yeah, just on that, do, I th do you think that's a real shame for, for English football as well? That, that players such as, I don't know, Elliot Anderson, for example, has to move away from Newcastle. Um, you know, even Jan Kuba Minter never played a minute for, for Newcastle as well. But in terms of those homegrown talents, do you think that's a shame for the, the average football fan? Yeah, I saw Elliot Anderson play at Bristol Rovers and I met him and I thought, this player's going all the way. 
you know, and I'm not a particularly good judge of players, but everyone at Bristol Rovers said he is fantastic. He was obviously on loan there from Newcastle United. I thought we saw his performance last night for Nottingham Forest against Crystal Palace, if I'm allowed to mention them in, in Kieran's company, although I probably can because they lost. <laughs> but, you know, you just look to his performance there and, OK, so it's all tie slightly tied in with the Greek goalkeeper who moved the other way, but he's more than a £35 million talent already. So, yeah, I agree with you. You know, he's Wolves End Boys Club. He's, was his grandfather or his great-uncle played for... Or, um, for, for Newcastle in the 60s. He's embedded in the club, and I think it's sad when you lose players like that because fans love singing one of our own.